Hi, good evening, everyone. We want to welcome you this evening to this, our Youth Week of Prayer. We started yesterday uh, with Elder Raheem Smith from the Palmyra Church, and we will continue with that this evening. And so it's a joy to know that we can be here this evening in the comfort of our home. As you know, the curfew is at 2 p.m., so we could not take it from a live stream, but we're very happy that you could have joined us this evening as we give the young people of our district the opportunity to showcase their talents that God has blessed them with. And so it's my delight this evening to welcome you to this, our first evening of this our week of prayer. I am Pastor Yuzel Parks, and with me this evening is my lovely wife, Sister Dixon Parks, and we are here to carry you throughout this evening's program. Sister Parks, could you tell us what is our theme for this week of prayer? Our theme for this week of prayer is reconnecting to our identity. What is that again? Reconnecting to our identity. All right. So that's it, brethren. Reconnecting to our identity. And our identity is found in Jesus Christ. And just before we, we kickstart the program, there was a little girl who was flying in an aircraft. And while the aircraft is moving through the, the air, there was some kind of turbulence and everyone was trying their very best to see how they would deal with the turbulence because they don't know what would have happened after hearing that turbulence. So everybody was shuffling and bustling and trying to work things out. But there was a little girl that sat quietly in the plane, in her seat, reading her book. And everyone was so astonished as to why this little girl wasn't bothered with what was happening around. So when the plane landed, when it finally landed, they asked the little girl, how comes did you really happen to remain so calm during the turbulence that we encountered uh, in the sky. And the little girl responded and said, I was able to remain calm because my daddy is the pilot. And because my daddy is a pilot, I know he's taking me home. What a wonderful story. She remained quiet because she knew that her father was the pilot and because her father was the pilot. Her father was taking her home. This evening, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is our pilot. He is our identity, and he will take us home. Shall we bow our heads together as we pray? For our loving Father and our God, we give you thanks this evening for your goodness towards us. As we have come this another evening to worship you, to magnify your name, we pray, Lord, that you will be with the proceedings of this program. Bless all those who will participate, Lord, and may this week of prayer be to your name's honor and glory. This is our asking in Jesus' name. Once again, welcome, brothers and sisters. At this time, we will turn over to the Latchman sisters as they will take us through our praise and worship. Good evening, everyone. We'll be doing the song service for this evening. We are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again in one accord. Something good is going to happen. Something good is in store. We are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again 
just praising the Lord. We are together again in one accord. Something good is going to happen. Something good is in store. We are together again, just praising the Lord. Something in my heart, like a stream running down. It makes me feel so happy, as happy as can be. When I think of Jesus and what he has done for me, there is something in my heart like a stream running down. It's coming down, down, down. It's coming down. Praise the Lord when the glory of the Lord is coming down. Hallelujah when the saints begin to pray and the Lord shall have his way. When the glory of the Lord is coming down, it'll soon be done. When showers and trials, when I get home on the other side, I'm gonna shake my hands with the others. I'm gonna tell all the people good morning. I'm gonna sit down beside my Jesus. I'm gonna sit down and rest a little while. Wrap my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Wrap my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Wrap my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, wrap my soul. Amen. 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 Amen and amen. Amen and amen. What a mighty God we serve. All right, we're moving right ahead. And this evening to do the, what is coming up next? The welcome and introduction. Right, the welcome and introduction of our program with Sister... Sister P. Hall. Sister P. Hall will take us now uh, through the welcome and introduction of our program. Good evening, everyone. We are so happy to have you this evening with us here at the Lilliput Seventh-day Adventist Church. We want to welcome you to our first night of Youth Week of Prayer online worship experience. We welcome you this evening. We welcome you who are joining in us from Baritone. We welcome you from Palmyra. We also welcome the Power of Love Seventh-day Adventist Church, Oceanites, Sabbath School, and of course, our members here at the Lilliput Seventh-day Adventist Church. And for those that are viewing us live on YouTube, we welcome you and we thank you so much for joining us this evening as we commence, as again, our first night in our Youth Week of Prayer, and we'll be worshiping under the theme, Reconnecting to Our Identity. We hope as you watch this evening and share in this program that your hearts may be blessed. We pray that you may open your hearts and receive the blessings that will be poured out to you. But well, once again, I welcome you to our program. May your hearts be blessed this evening, and may you also share with a friend and let them know that something good is going on right over at the Lilliput Seventh-day Adventist Church. So welcome once, welcome twice. Welcome in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And thank you very much, Sister Paul. I do know that we are feeling welcome. We are feeling blessed and I don't know what you had for your Sunday dinner. Uh, what did you have for your Sunday? Um, steamed fish and rice. All right, so she had steamed fish and rice. I haven't had anything as yet, so um, I don't know what you had, but we hope that your bellies were really jam-packed. And if not, we have, there is still space because coming up shortly, we have a speaker who will give us the spiritual food so that your bellies can be filled with uh, some good food. 
All right, the, the program continues with opening song, and this will be followed by prayer. So we'll have the opening song, and this will be followed by prayer. And so Sister Merchant will lead us in the opening song, followed by Sister Hogarth with the opening prayer. The opening hymn is 185, Jesus is all the world to me, 185. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go, no other one can tear me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to his blessings and he gives them all and all. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest, gold and rain, sunshine and rain, harvest of grace. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I despair deny when he's so true to me? Following him, I know I'm right. He watches o'er me day and night. Following him by day and night, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I trust him well. Last fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. He's my friend. Right, we're waiting on Sister Hogart with the opening prayer. All right, we're not hearing her. Uh, bow your heads with us. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray. Dear Father, in humble adoration, I come before your throne. Lord, be full thanks for the blessings of life. So I mean to come to in worship, we ask for your forgiveness. So that for worship be pleasing and acceptable. Lord, to really invite your presence in our midst. We ask the Lord that as we worship tonight, Father, to pray with our son. I pray that whether it be an adult, I can pray that the way somebody to be so drew. But us pray for Lord, we pray to continue of thy own way within our lives. Take control now, pray, and ask of thee in your son's name. Amen. Amen and amen. Though Jesus' disciples were seasoned fishermen, 
they were terrified. They were terrified the day a storm threatened to swamp their boat. They were following Jesus' instructions. Why was this happening? He was with them, but he was, but he was asleep at the craft. They learned that day that it is not true that when we do as our Lord says, that there'll be no storms in our lives. Yet because he was with them, they also learned that storms don't stop us from getting us to the place where the Lord wants us to go. Whether the storm we encounter today is a result of a tragic accident, a loss of employment, are some other trials. We can be confident that all is not a loss. Our pilot can handle a storm and he will take us home. And that is a promise we have this evening that our pilot can handle a storm. I don't know what are your challenges, what are your difficulties, and we're here this evening to really have that fellowship with each other virtually and to pray and to worship God, because we do know that storms do not last forever because our pilot, Jesus Christ, will take us home. We will be having a special music coming up, and this will be done by Sister Donicia Williams, and that will be followed by a special feature, which will be done by Sister Abel. All right, so Sister Donicia Williams will give us the special, special music and then Sister A. Brown with a special feature.
Amen. What a beautiful song. And while we're waiting on Sister Brown with the special feature, we just want to, for those persons who are just joining us, we want to welcome you this evening to this, our week of prayer. We are worshiping for this week under the theme, reconnecting to our identity. We have already laid the foundation that our identity is found in Jesus Christ. And we need that solid rock foundation in which we can have our anchor uh, being held. So we welcome you. We welcome those persons on our YouTube channel at Lilliput SDA Media. We want to welcome you for those persons who are joining from outskirts of Lilliput District. We welcome you. And we hope that you will be blessed as we uh, continue with the program this evening. So at this time, we will have the special feature, which will be done by Sister A. E. Brown. And let's see if we can have the recording at this time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Angelica Morris Brown. This evening, I will be speaking to you briefly on how to boost the immune system. I will be using the acronym from the new start, but for this evening, I will be focusing on just the first four letters, which are N for nutrition, E for exercise, W water, and S sunlight. We will come.
Continue tomorrow with temperance, air, rest, and trusting in God. So for this evening, let us look firstly at what is the immune system. The immune system is the body's ability to fight against infections and it keeps a record of every microbe that it has defeated so it can easily recognize and destroy it if it should enter the body again. With that said, in order to boost the immune system, nutrition is of most importance. Eating from plant-based foods such as fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and legumes are rich in antioxidants. This may protect us from harmful pathogens which will lower our risk of getting sick. We now look at exercising. Exercising improves the body's overall fitness. Exercising also helps the immune system to perform effectively. When we exercise, it increases the blood flow, reduces stress and inflammation, and also boosts our immune system. Water. Water helps to transport oxygen throughout our body cells, which will result in our body performing or functioning properly. It also helps to remove toxins from our body. So drinking more water daily could prevent toxins from building up, which will have a negative impact on the immune system. An average of eight glass of water is recommended daily. Lastly, sunlight. Now, sunlight, we know that we get vitamin D, which is a nutrient, from sunlight. Sunlight is important for our bones, blood cells, and our immune system also. While some of us get enough vitamin D from food, children who do not get enough sunlight can get rickets. That is a deficiency of vitamin D and rickets softens and weakens their bones. So just to recap, to boost our immune system, we look at eating more plant-based foods such as our fruits, vegetables, nuts and grains, right? Those will lower our risk of getting ill or being sick. We look at exercise and we say exercising improves our overall fitness and helps the immune system to perform effectively. We also look at water. Water, we say, rehydrates this, our body and it helps to transport oxygen to our body cells. And we should drink at least eight glasses of water on average for the day. And lastly, sunlight. We know that we get our vitamin D from the sunlight. And we recommend that children get enough vitamin D to prevent rickets and to help strengthen their bones. All right? Join us again tomorrow evening when I will continue to look at the other four letters in the new start while we still talk about how we can boost our immune system. So we will look at temperance, air, rest, and trusting in God. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and enjoy the rest of the evening's program. Thank you. And thank you very much, Sister E. Brown, for those timely reminder as to how we can keep our bodies healthy. Now we will have the scripture reading by Sister T. Thomas, followed by a season of prayer by Elder O. Dennis.
Good evening, everyone. Please turn your Bible to John 4, verses 1 to 6. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joshua. Now Jacob well was there. Jesus, therefore, being worried with his journey, sat us on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Here ended a portion of God's holy word. We honor it by saying, thanks be to God. Mm -mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sister uh, Thomas. Elder Dennis will now lead us into our season of prayer. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. It's now a prayer time. We will be approaching our Lord and our Savior in prayer. Uh, we serve a mighty God. Um, yesterday, I had a high experience with prayer. Uh, we were summoned to visit a home where a young miss was possessed with demons. And we saw immediately how mightily God can work through prayer. And so as we pray, uh, we will believe that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Let us pray. Our great God and our Father, we come before you this evening, O God, trusting and claiming your promises that we are to come boldly to your throne of grace to your throne of mercy, to your throne of love, to your throne of righteousness and of judgment. And so as we come this evening, O oh God, with all confidence, believing and claiming your blood that was shed for the atonement of our sins, Lord, we ask you, O oh God, even as we come in this fashion, in the virtual space, we ask you, O oh Jesus, that you will cleanse that you will wash us, that you will create in us, O oh God, a clean heart, that you will help us, O oh Father, to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto thee, that we may know what is the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. O oh Lord, as we continue these um, nightly meetings, uh, this youth, a week of prayer and revival. Oh God, we, commit, we commend this program in your hand. We ask you, oh God, that it will not be an ordinary program, that it will not be a program merely to entertain, but oh God, it will be a program, oh Father, to revive and to bring alive again every one of your children, especially our young people, oh God, we pray divine God, that you will send the power of your Holy Spirit, that night after night, as you send your messages through your servants, oh God, they will bring heart burn to our hearts. Our hearts will burn within us and we will cry out, oh God, I yield, I surrender all to you, oh God. Help us, oh Father, to lay all and the sacrifice of altar. Uh, and the sacrifice, elder of sacrifice, so that, oh God, we will, oh God, be a pleasing uh, sacrifice unto you. Holy Father, take control. Be with ever visitors. Be with every individual that is aligned and the families that are represented. Touch, oh God, save to the uttermost. And we pray for the speaker. Elder Rahim, who you, whom you have chosen, oh God, I pray that you will continue to use him mightily. Anoint him afresh with a double portion of your Holy Spirit, so that as he speak, oh God, he will speak 
that the arrows of your words will pierce our hearts, not to kill us, but to kill self and to crucify self so that we may be, O oh God, your instruments, your servants of righteousness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much for that powerful prayer. And just to inform those of us on the Zoom platform that you can type your prayer requests in the chat, whatever requests you have, you can type them in the chat. We have persons who are recording those requests and we will uh, be careful to uh, lift up your requests to God uh, while we go through the program this evening. For those persons on our YouTube platform, you can also type those requests in the chat. You can reach out to us. Let us know what you want us to pray for, and we will be praying for you. We will be praying for you. All right, we will be having the offertory at this time. Sister L. Dennis will come on and to give us, to lead us into the offertory. Then Elder Dennis will return and to introduce our speaker, and the program will flow in that order. So Sister Dennis will take us through the offertory, and Elder Dennis will introduce to us the speaker for this evening. Well, it's giving time. And I know, I'm sure all of us have something to give God thanks for whether we are going to give in terms of monetary giving or even with our time. And so we are reminded in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy father, as it is this day. And members, members along with visiting friends. If you can, you're now seen on your screen, we have our online platforms for giving according to the different churches. You can go ahead and view, write down the information and go ahead and send your monetary offering, your contribution. But if it is that you don't have your monetary contribution, you can always give off your time. You can share the link with a friend to join you can also give up your time by joining our program in the, in the evenings. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for wealth that you have given us, for health and strength where we can go out and work. And so, Lord, even at this time, those who have to give and those who don't have to give, we pray, Lord, that you will bless us individually and collectively. Continue to be with us as your people and help us, Lord, to understand that we can also give of our time to help others to know you so that they too can be a part of your eternal kingdom. Continue to bless and keep us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Dennis. Thank you so much. Uh, we are moving right along. It's the time when we will hear from God's mouthpiece. And so the person who is in place to introduce our speaker is our elder from, our first elder from Lilliput Church, Elder Omar Dennis. And so we invite Elder Dennis at this time, um, Sister Parks, to uh, present us the introduction of our speaker. But just once again, brethren, please type your prayer requests in the, in the chat. We want to pray for you. We want to lift you up to God. This is Youth Week of Prayer, reconnecting to our, ident our identity. Our identity is found in Jesus Christ. Some of us, we may have lost that identity along the way, but thank God through his grace and through his shed blood on Calvary, we have that blood available to us today. And because it is available, we can regain our identity in Jesus Christ. So Elder 
Dennis, could you please um, tell us this evening who God has prepared with a word to feed his children at this time? Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Parks. It is my pleasure and it's a great delight to introduce the man of God uh, tonight who is going to break the bread of life to us. He's a young man. He's my friend. Uh, we have known each other ever since he graced us at uh, the Lilliput Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, by speaking a number of times at Lilliput. I must say that he's also, he was ordained as one of the youngest elder in West Jamaica Conference at the Palmyra Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was ordained only while attending uh, Cornwall College. And uh, many may not know that this young man, he, he, he was initially enrolled at UWI to, to undertake the study of becoming a medical doctor. Uh, but in his first year, he got the call uh, that he should make the switch and go into full-time religion um, study, theology. And so he made this bold step and currently he is enrolled at Northern Caribbean University uh, where he's now majoring in religion. And uh, uh, he, he has been conducting numerous evangelistic campaign and Bible studies all over. So the Lord has been using him mightily. And every time uh, we hear this young man, uh, we... We sense his growth. We sense his passion and his deep study for the word. And I know that as Elder Raheem Smith comes to us tonight, he will come to us with a message from God. He will come with a message for the young people. He will come with a message for those who are seasoned with God's grace. But before Elder Rahim Smith comes to us. We, our hearts will be prepared with a meditation song by Sister Donicia Williams. And then you will hear God's voice through Elder Rahim Smith. God bless you.
Amen. I'd like to thank Sister Danicia Williams for those lovely songs, and particularly that last one, Your Grace Still Amazes Me. Good evening, everyone, and I'd like to thank you very much for joining us on our first night of our Youth Week of Prayer series here in the Lilliput District of Churches, and we're worshiping under the theme, Reconnecting to Our Identity. Yesterday, we focused on reconnecting to Christ. And today, as we continue to delve into the theme, reconnecting to our identity, a subtopic that we'll be looking on is reconnecting to our mission. And I've entitled it, To Heal a Hurting World. We'll realize, friends, that the very mission of Jesus Christ is the very mission that he wants his people to engage in. And the same way that he is the healer of not just the body, but the souls of men and women, it's the same way that he wants us to cooperate with him in bringing healing to our world, even as it is hurting at this particular time. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray to begin our talk for this evening. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to come into your presence at this time. Father, I am not worthy to be standing in this stead at this particular moment. But I am praying, O oh God, for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. I'm praying, dear Father, that you will illuminate your words. I pray, Lord, that you will bring them to life and allow them to speak to our lives and our situations. I'm praying, O oh Lord, that you will allow that the, this particular message will reach us in the very place where it is most needed. Help us to understand, dear Lord, that there is a healing balm in your son jesus christ help us to understand dear father that he has a better plan for our lives 
that we have for ourselves and help us to also understand that it is his desire to use us to bless others and to heal our world that is hurting and aching in so many ways and on so many levels at this particular time. Please guide us now as we discuss your words and may your name and your name only be honored, loved and exalted, we pray in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. So reconnecting to our mission and we're looking on to heal a hurting world. Now, I want to begin by actually reviewing some lessons that we would have learned from 2020 or from 2021. And as we look back at the year 2020 and so far what we've experienced from 2021 in review, realize that our world would have been in a worldwide pandemic, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic um, particularly. There has been social instability. There has been financial strain on so many levels. There has been domestic challenges. And even in our particular country, we've realized in 2021 especially that there is a worrisome trend of domestic abuse of our women. And we also have seen major loss of life. Yes, related to COVID-19, but also on so many other levels. For example, the crime and violence in our local nation you know, has caused tremendous loss of lives even recently. So as we look back in review, we'd have seen all of these things. And one major lesson that I think we would have learned or that everybody would have realized is that we are in need of healing as individuals, as institutions, and as nations. And the healing that we're talking about here, friends, is not merely physical healing. It's not just the restoration of the body from disease, but we're talking about healing mentally, healing emotionally, and healing spiritually as well. And this is a very important point that we want to bring out from this evening's message, how Jesus Christ is able to provide the very same healing that we are so badly in need of, even at this particular time. And the basic premise of this entire message is that the source of true healing is none other than God himself. And so just as our pastor part should have eloquently said that our identity is found in Jesus Christ, our healing is also found in him. He is the source of our healing and our restoration. And we'll realize that when we experience the transformation that he has come to bring in our own lives, we will be able to play some role in bringing healing to the lives of others as well. And let's go ahead into our discussion, into our study for today. I invite you to look with me in your Bibles at John chapter 4, reading verse 3 to verse 6. John chapter 4, verse 3 to verse 6. And this is what the Bible says there. It is speaking of Jesus, and it says, He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Verse 5 says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And verse 6 says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, or in other words, it was about 12 o'clock. So this is describing Jesus' journey from Judea to Galilee, regions in ancient Israel. Judea would have been in the south, Galilee in the north. And for Jesus to travel from Judea to Galilee, he has to travel in, through a region that is in between both of them. And that region is known as Samaria. So the point I want to make fr from the very beginning, from the get-go, is that Jesus knew that where he was, as he sat on that well, 12 o'clock, you know, thirsty, waiting on a drink of water, he knew that he was standing or he was sitting and in a very historical landmark at a very important place. And he knew that something major would have happened in the very same area that he was traversing through. Now, do you know why Jesus would know that where he was was a very important place? And this is somewhere that I want to emphasize, friends, that as we study the word of God, as we study the Bible, every single detail is important. And so sometimes when we read the Bible, for example, we pass over some details, 
But if you were to look at the details, even those things that seem insignificant or small or like they don't really matter in the narrative, when you take the time out to look into those details, we actually realize that they bring the story to life in such a powerful way that we've never seen it before. And one of those important details in this particular account is found in verse five, when it says that Jesus came to Sychar, a city of Samaria, but it described the city by saying that it was near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. So as we begin this evening, we want to ask ourselves the question, what is the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph? You know, when I, when I was reading, when I was studying this particular um, passage for the first time, I could not imagine what, par what parcel of ground Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. I didn't remember anywhere that the Bible referred to a piece of land that Jacob gave to Joseph. And so I, I began with these two questions. What is the parcel of ground or what is the plot of land that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph? And what is the significance of that area? Why is this so important? that John, who wrote the gospel according to John, would have mentioned it in the story. The very fact that he mentioned it means that there's something important there. So we want to ask ourselves the question, what is that plot of land and why is it important anyway? And when we study into this particular thing, friends, we'll realize that there is a deep message there that is of great significance to you and I as we're living at this particular time in Earth's history. So let's begin by looking at where the Bible mentioned the piece of land that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 33, reading verse 18 and 19. Genesis chapter 33, reading verse 18 and 19. This is what the Bible says there. It says, and Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. Now notice verse 19 carefully. It says, and he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for an hundred pieces of money. So remember those details. The fact that Jacob bought this piece of land from the children of Hamor, the Bible tells us that Hamor is the father of Shechem. And the Bible also tells us that Jacob bought this particular piece of land for 100 pieces of money. Now hold your hand there in Genesis 33 and journey with me to Joshua 24, verse 32. Remember, we're asking ourselves the question, what piece of land did Jacob give to his son Joseph? And why is that land so important that John mentioned it in the story with the woman at the well? Look at me at Joshua 24, verse 32. This is what it says there. It says, And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for an hundred pieces of silver. Now hold on there. I want us to realize that this is the very same piece of land that the Bible is talking about in Genesis 33, verse 18 and 19. We know that because it tells us that Jacob bought it from the children of Hamor. The Bible refers to Hamor as the father of Shechem, and it tells us that he bought it for a hundred pieces of money. The same language that is used in Genesis 33 is used here in Joshua 24. It's basically telling us that this is the same piece of land that it's talking about. But notice how Joshua 24, verse 32 ends. The verse ends by saying that this piece of land became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. So in other words, to answer the question, our first question, which is what piece of land did Jacob give to his son Joseph? This is the land that we're talking about. The land that Jacob would have bought from the children of Hamor for a hundred pieces of money. It became the inheritance of the descendants of Joseph, the Bible tells us. No. The next question we want to ask ourselves is what is so important about this piece of land and what happened there? And I think this is where things get a little bit interesting. If we look at Genesis chapter 34, 
Remember Genesis 33, 18 and 19 tells us about the piece of land. That's how that chapter basically ends. But if you look at Genesis 34, verse 1 and 2, the Bible tells us that something very unfortunate happened at that particular piece of land that Jacob would have bought and that he would have given to Joseph. And by the way, that's, the, that's basically the same piece of land where J Jesus was 1,700 years later when he was sitting on the well. There's something very important that happened there. The Bible tells us in Genesis 34. In Genesis 34, verse 1 and 2, this is what it says. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. So in other words, the Bible is telling us that when Jacob bought that piece of land, eventually his daughter went out because, you know, she wanted to meet friends with those individuals or with the other ladies that were living nearby. So she wanted to meet the other tribes and the other women and basically to, you know, become a part of their clique, to become their friend, to kind of fit into their society, if you want to say it that way. So verse 2 tells us that something unfortunate happened when she went to do this. It tells us, and when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. To put it in modern terms, basically, Shechem raped Jacob's daughter, Dinah. So basically what happened was that when she went out to meet friends with the other women, with the other girls, to basically meet the rest of them and, you know, to fit in with them, unfortunately, the Bible tells us that this gentleman who was a prince of the country, in other words, he was a ruler, he was like a governor, somebody that was in charge of the area, somebody with great power and authority. The Bible says that when he saw Jacob's daughter, he actually took her and he actually raped her. No, friends, this is something that is, very, is a very sensitive issue. And as we go through this message, we'll realize why we're bringing it, bringing it up. Let me just begin to explain the context of the times. In this particular time of Earth's history, especially among in the culture of, of the Middle East and in the culture of Israel at the time, what would happen was that if a woman was defiled, meaning that you know, she had sexual relations outside of marriage before she was married, or something like this happened, you know, she was raped or something like that. It was often the case that shame was thrown upon her entire family because of that. And it was also often the case that she would not be, be allowed to marry somebody else and to have children and to live a normal life. So in other words, to a great extent, unfortunately, many women who these unfortunate things happened to actually became outcasts in society at the time. And I want to ask you the question, how do you think Dinah felt? You know, she did not go out there looking for trouble. But when she went there, you know, this unfortunate thing happened to her. And it's sad that even here in 2021, we're now living in a time when many of the women, many of the young women in our country cannot even feel safe to travel, to take a taxi, to go with an older gentleman, gentleman somewhere. Many young women cannot feel safe or, or they cannot accept or, or they cannot expect or assume that they'll be protected by those who should be looking out for them. Friends, how do you think Dinah felt? And how do you think Jacob and his sons felt when the news actually reached them? And another point I want to make, friends, brothers and sisters, is the fact that sometimes unfamiliar or unfortunate, I should say, circumstances like these happen to us. Now, I'm not saying that for the majority of cases, we would have gone through experiencing, you know, rape or sexual abuse or something like that. But sometimes, you know, some unfortunate things happen to us. And let me just say this, especially as it pertains to sexual cases where these things happen, it is often the case that, you know, people want to just be silent about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. People just want to shut down. And, you know, some people don't know who to turn to or who to trust when circumstances like these arise. Sometimes it, it breaks individuals and sometimes it, it brings pain to their family as well. And friends, the basic point of this message is that God wants to heal everyone who would have found themselves in unfortunate circumstances like these. Not only does he want to heal them, but he has the power and ability, and he is the only one that can truly restore their souls and mend the brokenness that they would have experienced. 
And friends, this is a very important message for us at this particular time, because there are so many families within this very country who would have suffered unfortunate things like these happening to their loved ones. And some of them are still experiencing emotional and psychological trauma. And the work of the gospel is to actually bring healing to these individuals by connecting them with the source of healing, which is God. And let's press on as we talk about this particular message. I just want to summarize what happened in the rest of the story in Genesis 34 quickly. What happened, friends, is that when Jacob's sons heard the news of what happened to Dinah, they were livid. The Bible says that they were very wroth. In other words, they were angry. And the way they responded to the situation, basically, to cut the long story short, is that they killed not just Shechem, who raped Dinah, but they went into the city and they killed all the men of the city. Now, the way they did it was, was very dreadful because they told the men, you know, Shechem, who raped Dinah, he actually loved her, the Bible says. And so he, he, he actually went to Jacob and he told Jacob, you know, I want to marry your daughter. And he actually told Jacob's sons that if you allow me to, to marry your daughter, you know, we can, our tribes can intermarry with each other. We'll give you our daughters. You can give us your daughters. You know, we'll intermarry. We'll become more powerful. We'll become more wealthy and stuff like that. And Jacob's sons actually made it seem as if they were going along with the idea. But you know what they told the men? They told the men, you know what? You have to, you, you, you can't just become a part of us like that. You have to become circumcised. And so Shechem actually was so sincere, even though what he did to Dinah was wrong. You know, he was so sincere in saying that he loved her, that he actually convinced all the men of his city to get circumcised. And friends, in those days, there was no anesthesia. So in other words, when they cut something, it was cut. And the Bible tells us that when the men were circumcised, they were sore. In other words, they were feeling so, pain, so much pain, they never have any use. And the Bible tells us that when they were sore, two of Jacob's sons basically went into the city and killed all the men. Now, I'm bringing up this point to raise a very important, and a very important principle or a very important fact. And the fact is, it's often the case that when we are hurt, when we experience pain, when we feel that somebody has caused us to suffer, whether really or in imagination, it is often the case that our recourse, our response, is to try to hurt the people that hurt us. And this happens on so many levels, whether in marital relationships, whether in our relationships at work or in the wider family. It's often the case that when we feel attacked, when we feel that like somebody is hurting us, or when we feel hurt because of something somebody did, we try to hurt them in return. But I want to ask this very important question. Did the response of Jacob's sons actually help Dinah? Remember, you know, they were angry because of what happened to their sister, who was raped, who was abused, who was broken as a result of what happened, who suffered trauma emotionally and psychologically. But my question is that when they went into the city and killed all the men of the city, did that bring healing to Dinah's heart? And another question is, what did their actions actually achieve? Their actions caused suffering not only to, to the family of Shechem and the family of, of Shechem's father, Hamor, but they caused suffering to so many wives and children who were innocent. In other words, it was not their husbands that raped Dinah, but Jacob's sons killed their husbands and basically took the wives and children captive. And more seriously than that, they misrepresented the character of God to the Canaanites. In other words, they were painting the picture that the God that they claimed to serve was a God who was vindictive. In other words, if God does something to you, then if, or if you do something to hurt God, in other words, God will do something to you in return to try to get even. And this is another very important principle, friends, as we talk about reconnecting to our identity. Our identity is found in Jesus Christ. To say that principle in another way or to translate that principle in another sense would be translated in this way. Since our identity is found in Jesus Christ, right? It means that when we claim to be children of Jesus and when we live in the world, the very image that we show to the world, that is how people will view the God that we serve. 
So in other words, if we are, are people who are vindictive, if we are people who are unforgiving, if we are people who cause hurt and pain and suffering to others, they will view the God that we serve in the same way because we are intimately connected with God. And friends, that is a very important principle to understand. We are representing the character of God to the world. And we can either misrepresent that character or we can represent him correctly. The basic point I want to make, friends, is that the action of Jacob's sons caused anguish to the Shechemites. It caused anguish to Jacob and his household. And it did not ease their own suffering. In other words, it did not cause them to feel any better. And the Israelites lost a precious opportunity to truly represent the character of God to those people, the Shechemites and to the Canaanites. The Bible says in Romans 12, verse 19 to 21, it basically mentions the principle of not being overcome by evil, but overcoming evil with good. And friends, I'm just saying hypothetically that if the, the, if the children of Israel at this time were to actually represent the character of God in the way that God has shown it to us in, through his word, then that would have had such a powerful impact on Shechem, who would have caused such pain to Dinah, and all the people looking on them as well. I'm not saying that what Shechem did was correct in raping Dinah. It was wrong. I'm not saying that they should not, there should be no justice in dealing with circumstances like this. Justice has to take place and it has to be meted out. But what I am saying, that it is often the case that we misrepresent the character of God when we end up in circumstances like these. Because sometimes the way we deal with it is by retribution and not by redemption. In other words, we're trying to cause hurt and pain to those who hurt us instead of trying to show them the love of God. And friends, I want to just anchor this point that this unfortunate account of what happened to Dinah when she was sexually abused, it actually took place in the same geographical area where Jesus ministered to the woman at the well 1,700 years afterwards. And the very mistake that was made by the children of Jacob when they misrepresented the character of God was actually corrected by Jesus Christ in how he dealt with the woman at the well. And friends, I just want to summarize this portion quickly as we look on the difference with how Jesus dealt with the woman at the well and the difference with how Jacob's sons dealt with the situation when Dinah would have been you know, raped or sexually abused. The Bible tells us in Genesis 4, in John 4, verse 6, sorry, that when Jesus was sitting on the well, it was about 12 o'clock. In other words, it was the time that the sun was hottest. You know, he was sitting on the well, he was thirsty, he was walking. You can imagine he was probably sweating and he needed a drink of water. But the Bible tells us that he saw a woman approaching at that particular moment in time. And I just want to say to us, friends, that the very minute Jesus saw that woman approaching him, he knew that there was something about her that was different. And, you know, Jesus is very observant. And, friends, it's often the case that when persons are going through some sort of, you know, pain or emotional turmoil, Sometimes they might not come to you and speak out loud what is happening in their innermost soul, but it is sometimes noticeable in some of the, the actions or behaviors that they go on with. But the sad reality is that sometimes we are not so observant. You know, even with our young people, it's often the case that many of them have been through some unfortunate circumstances, but they won't just open up and talk about them like that. But sometimes they, we see them withdrawing. Sometimes we see them going into their shell or being silent and being quiet and not being as outgoing or as interactive or as involved as they used to be. And sometimes, friends, if we were observant, if we were paying attention to those little details, we could tell that something might be a bit off and we could actually speak to them, try to encourage them and try to help them in whatever way we can or if we cannot connect them with a source of help. So Jesus knew that something was off with this lady. And the reason he knew was because he was coming to the well to draw water at 12 o'clock. And it's not, that's not the usual time when women would go to, to draw water in those days for the simple fact that the sun was hot. So in other words, what she was trying to do when she came to the well at 12 o'clock was that she was trying to isolate herself. In other words, she never wanted to mingle with the other women. 
she was view, she was an outcast in her own mind because she knew that the type of life she was living was socially unacceptable. And like how Dinah was an outcast based on what happened to her, we find a similar thing here with the woman at the well. But we realize that Jesus dealt with her case very differently. Now, I just want to emphasize the point quickly that Jesus engaged that woman in conversation. And he, the way he did it was expert. If you have time to study into it, please study John chapter 4. But this is the main point I want to raise. In his conversation with her, Jesus led the woman to the point of realizing that there is something more to life. Than, that he has to offer her. In other words, he used the very image of what she was there to do. The, she was there to draw water. Jesus talked to her about salvation using the, image of, the imagery of living water. And he was basically saying to her that he, he is able to satisfy the deepest needs of her soul. And friends, that is the power of the gospel. He was basically saying to her that he has a better life you know, he, he wants to invite her to be a part of the family of God, where she will not be viewed as an outcast. When she's viewed as an outcast by men, by sinful men, she will not be viewed as an outcast by the sinless, holy, infinite God. And Jesus was presenting that good message to her, and that is the message that we should be presenting to the world. But this is the interesting point I want to, I want to raise up. And, you know, she even re referenced Jacob in the conversation. Are you greater than our father, Jacob? And little did she know that Jesus is the one who would have established Jacob. You know, but the point I want to make is that she eventually came to the point where she said to Jesus, you know, I want that living water so that I don't have to come back and draw water here. And, you know, Jesus brought her to that point of she saying that I want what you have to offer. I want the gospel. I want the healing that you have come to bring. And, you know, many times... At that point in the conversation, our response would probably be, all right, sign them up for baptism. Let's go ahead with it and let's just invite them in. But you know, before Jesus did all of that, he actually abruptly changed the conversation. When she reached the point of saying, I want what you have to offer, Jesus said to her, go and call your husband. No mind you know, she and Jesus never have any conversation about any husband as I wind down quickly. But before Jesus said, all right, let's come and, you know, just join me and everything. Jesus said, go and call your husband. And my question is, why would Jesus change the conversation like that at that point? The answer is simple. This woman was broken and she was hurting and she was in need of healing. And before she could receive the gift that Jesus had to give her, she needed to open up her heart to him so that he can bring that restoration to her. And that is a very important point for us to understand. Friends, as we try to bring the gospel to the world, as we try to lead others into a saving relationship with God, there are areas in their lives where they are hurting based on things that they would have experienced, based on past events or based on something that they're going through right now. And the gospel is not just about telling them that God loves them. It's about showing them that God loves them by actually showing that we care for them, by actually helping them at the point where they are hurting. And it is by doing that, it is as they find relief through those means that their hearts will be open to receive the greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Jesus wants to give them. This was what happened for the lady friends, and this is what needs to happen for us as well. You know, there are many of us even who might even be in the church for years who might still be hurting based on things that happened to us in way down a way, way. How many years ago? You know, we have not forgiven. We have not found peace. We have not let go of that pain. And friends, if we do not find that healing in God, we will always be closing a part of our hearts away from him because the bitterness will be clinging to when God is saying he wants to set us free. And friends, you know, I, I won't go into it because I have to wind down at this particular point and drive the message home. But if you compare and contrast the story of Dinah and the woman at the well, you realize there was so, so many similarities between them as it pertains to them. The woman at the well, you know, she was not raped per se, but she had five husbands, Jesus said, and the one that she was now with was not her husband. Evidently, she was being taken advantage of sexually. And, you know, same thing with, similar thing with Dinah. 
they were all cast according to society, they were in need of healing and restoration. And that is what Jesus actually came to give. You know, Jesus led the woman at the well to receive healing. And you know what point made her receive the healing? It was when she found out the identity of Jesus. When she found out, when Jesus said to her, she said, you know, she said to him at one point in the conversation, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will show us all things. Jesus said to her, I that speak unto thee, am he. And when she knew the identity of Christ, when she realized that this man, this person that was there in human form was the creator of the world, is the savior of the world. He's the one that has all the power and authority in the world. She realized that this man was somebody who she could trust with her entire life. She realized, friends, that this was somebody who she could trust with the secrets of her innermost soul. She realized that this was her creator. And she realized, friends, that her creator, even though he knew everything that she did, everything that she had been through, he was not judgmental. He was not condemning her, but he loved her. That is what led her to open her heart to God, open her heart to the influence of the Holy Spirit. And the very minute her heart was open to God. She became a missionary. In other words, the very moment she, got, she was healed by Jesus Christ, she was healed of the wounds that sin had caused in the soul. She went to bring healing to others as well. She went into the city to, to call the men and tell them, come see a man who told me all things that I, ever I did. And I would imagine she called some of the very same men who would have taken advantage of her in the past. In other words, friends, when we receive the gospel, not just intellectually, but we receive it into our heart. We receive its principles into our soul. We will become agents of healing and transformation to our fellow human beings. We will lead others to be connected with Christ so that the same healing which we have enjoyed, they will experience as well. And friends, can I say to us that that is what our nation is in need of right now. Yes, so many unfortunate circumstances happen. But when they happen, what is the result? Are we only going to, to, I'm not, you know, and mind you, there's a place for legal matters, for the police, for institutions like Child Development Agency and all of these things. There is a place for them and they should not be neglected. But when their work would have been done thoroughly and the individuals are left at home losing their loved ones or after experiencing that abuse, they are in need of healing that only God can give. And the simple point I'm making, friends, is that maybe you are in need of that healing today. You know, the Bible tells us that our God is the God who heals us. Psalm 107 tells us that he sent forth his word and healed them. And I would say to us, friends, that when we are preaching the gospel to the world, it's ultimately so that people can be healed from all the oppression of the devil. Now, I don't know if you yourself would have experienced some trauma in the past that you might be holding on to. I don't know if there's some young person here that something terrible happened to them that they are afraid to share with their elders or their parents or you know, somebody that they can talk to. But I want to ask you the question, are you willing to allow God to heal you of past and present trauma? Are you willing to cry to God for help? The Bible tells us he is a God who heals us. He is willing and ready and excited to bring total and holistic healing and restoration. And all he's asking us to do is to come to him. You know, if you are in need of healing today, I invite you to, to either raise your hands or to type in the chat, heal me, Lord. If you want to be an agent to help others, type in the chat, help me to heal others. We're going to pray at this particular time, friends, and we're going to leave these matters in the hands of God. There might be some things that you have been through that you do not want to talk to anyone else about, and that all you feel, you know, no other human being you think really can help you in terms of the help that you really need. But I want to invite you that you can trust your case with God. And as he did it for the woman at the well, he can do it for you today. And he will use you to bring healing to others. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this message. Lord, we have to be temperate. And so I thank you for helping me to cut it short in righteousness. But I thank you, O oh God, for allowing your Holy Spirit to drive the point home. That we are in need of healing. We are broken on so many levels. And so many times we try to patch ourselves up together. We try to make it as if we look all right and everything is okay. We smile on the outside. But only you know the tears that are in our heart. And Father, as I come before you, oh God, I don't know what your children would have been through individually. There may be some young person here who might have been taken advantage of just as how Dinah and the woman at the well was. There might be somebody here who might be holding on to some pain that they experienced years ago. There might be somebody here whose family member would have been taken advantage of, murdered, or something would have happened to them, oh God, and there might be some pain in their heart that has lingered all these years. Father, as these individuals would have said in the chat, heal me, Lord, asking for your healing, as they're asking you to help them to heal others and to bring healing to our hurting world. I am praying, oh Father, that you might help us as you help the woman at the well to open up our hearts to you. Lord, there are some issues that we feel hurt so much that we don't want you to bring it up. Just as the woman at the well did not want Jesus to bring up the point of her past and what she was going through. But, oh God, sometimes you are bringing it up not to hurt us, but so that you can heal us. Father, I am praying that you might help us to realize that we can trust you. Help us to lay the burden at the foot of the cross. Help us to find the healing, oh God, that only you can bring. And Lord, we know based on your word that when we are healed, we will become in turn agents for healing of our society. Oh Lord, our country is aching and is in pain from crime and violence, from domestic abuse, from sexual immorality. Oh God, from all this wickedness that is happening. And Lord, you have said that your son Jesus Christ was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And Father, we as his children, we whose identities are intimately connected with his, are called to do the very same work, which is to undo the work of sin by bringing healing and restoration to the hearts of men. Oh Lord, this power is not in us, but as we connect men and women with the source of true healing, which is Jesus Christ, they will find relief, not just for their body, but for their soul, for their mind, for their emotions. Lord, I am praying that you will do this work in our lives today. And I'm thanking you for what you are about to do. I'm thanking you, oh God, for the chains that you are about to break, for the freedom you are about to allow us to experience. I thank you for your healing and restoration. I thank you for the change that you are about to make in this country and in our world, in our church. And I pray, O oh Lord, that all those who are hurt, all those who are broken, might be mended. Because it is, your, it is your privilege, it is your honor, you enjoy mending broken people. Thank you so much, O oh God. And we praise your name. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful night. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elder Raheem Smith, for the way in which you have allowed the Lord to have used you this evening in such clear and practical way uh, with you giving us the details of how God can heal us in the real way. And there are many of us this evening who are hurting. There are many of us this evening as we have come to uh, this, this week of prayer. There are many of us who are hurting, hurting from past mistakes, hurting from uh, marital failures, hurting from having deranged children. There are so many problems that our society, that our members, that the people in our country are dealing with at this time. But as you reminded us this evening that we can get our healing from our identity and that identity is in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you so much for allowing the Lord to use you 
in such a humble and practical way. And we invite all our viewers, we invite those on Zoom platform and those on our YouTube platform to return tomorrow evening at 6, 6 p.m. when we shall do this all over again. The curfew tomorrow is at 8. And so we will have it from our live platform uh, from the studios of Lilliput Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so we want to welcome you back tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock when Elder Raheem Smith will once again present us, present to us with another life-changing word from Almighty God. So thank you so much. This evening, we are reminded, brethren, of a better life in Jesus Christ, a better home, a better priesthood, a better covenant. And because we have so much better things in store, prepared for God's children, this evening we can reconnect to our identity so that these things which are promised to us, we can gain them when the time comes and we would have been faithful to Almighty God. This evening, we had Mr. Anthony Murray, who I think is the counselor for the Lilliput Division. He was on, I am not sure if he's still on, but if he's still on, we want to recognize you, sir. Welcome to this old platform, and we pray that you were blessed and that you continue to come and receive more blessings. My very good friend and former co-host, of our Northeast programs there in the Northeast Conference. My very good friend, Sister Yashika Grant, she's tuning in all the way from Northeast Conference. And I'm very delighted, we're very delighted in the Lilliput District uh, to have you with us this evening. You have been very active on our YouTube page. And so we thank you so much. That's my very good friend, Sister Yashika Grant, uh, who has joined us this evening uh, for a week of prayer. I uh, thank you for joining Sister Grant and uh, do come again. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is not about telling. The gospel is about showing. That is the word from Elder Rahim Smith. The gospel is not about telling only. It's about showing. We want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. As I said earlier, we welcome you to join us again tomorrow evening when we shall do this all over again. On behalf of all our churches in this district, Palmyra, Lilliput, Ocean Heights, Power of Love, and Barrick Town, all youth departments, elders and leaders, the entire technical and production team, thank you for joining us this evening. Have a good night, and we will be able to meet again tomorrow evening. Until then, stay safe, stay blessed, and stay connected. At this time, Sister Maria Wallace will take us out with beautiful singing. My heart can sing. When I pause to remember a heart here is but a step in stone along a trail that's winding always upward this troubled world is not my final home but until then my heart will go on singing until then, with joy I carry on. Until the day of mine eyes behold that city. Until the day.
day, God calls me home. The things of earth will dim and lose their value if we recall their borrowed for a while. Things of earth that cause the heart to tremble. Remember then it will only bring a smile. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I carry Praise the Lord. Until then, let us keep singing. Ancient world. 